Thank you. And we have just heard that we are being recorded. So welcome back to our uh, uh, workshop on uh, the geometry of shapes. And uh, we're going to start the, I'm calling it in quote afternoon session because depending on where you live and where you are connected from, you may have a different concept of afternoon than uh, I do. We're going to have, we're going to start the afternoon session with uh, a three short presentation. These short presentations are going to be expected around 15 minutes and uh, maybe just a few questions after that. As in the morning section, if you have questions, please post them on the chat and we'll relay these questions to the speaker, either while they speak, if we feel the urgency or at the end of their talk. That said, I think it's time to start. And our first presenter in this short talk is Hannah dalpoz gorinska She's currently postdoc at uh, the uh, Institute of Science and Technology in Austria with Herbert Edelsbonner. And uh, we're going to hear about uh, uniformization with a discrete Gaussian curvature. So uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. Can you see when I write? Yes. Okay, that's good. <laughs> okay, so um, let's start. So first of all, thank you for having me. And uh, in these 15 minutes, I will present to you sort of a new or alternative formula for discrete Gaussian curvature for piecewise flat surfaces and uh, the corresponding and discrete uniformization theorem. So I'm sure you have all heard of the uniformization theorem, which is one of the pillars of 19th century mathematics. And it says that in every conformal class of a closed oriented Riemannian surface, there exists a metric, Riemannian metric with constant Gaussian curvature. And the goal of this talk is to sort of discretize this theorem. And in order to do this, we need to take it apart, have a look at its uh, building blocks, discretize these building blocks. And then once we discretize them, we put them all together, we get a new theorem out of it, and then we discuss the theorem. So um, in this talk, we have three building blocks, namely the conformal class, uh, which should be discretized by the discrete conformal class. Um, then the Riemannian surface, uh, which will be discretized by piecewise um, flat surface. Um, the metric, by the way, the Riemannian metric will be called piecewise linear, and I will abbreviate this with PL. And then the last and probably the sort of uh, new thing uh, will be the uh, discretization of the Gaussian curvature. Um, by the way, in this talk, I will always consider closed and oriented surface. So keep that in mind. I don't consider surfaces with boundary or um, non-oriented surfaces. Okay, and that's already uh, the outline of my talk. So I'll start by shortly um, telling you what's a piecewise flat surface and when two piecewise flat surfaces are discrete conformally equivalent. And um, as the third um, part, I will motivate and define this new formula or alternative formula for discrete Gaussian curvature. And having these three pieces together, I will talk about the um, corresponding discrete uniformization. So let's jump right in. So piecewise flat surface is a topological surface with a set of marked points, which I will denote by V, and a metric on this set of uh, marked points or on this, on this marked surface. And um, so this metric is somewhat like special or particular uh, at the neighborhood of the marked points and somewhat boring, let's say, um, uh, elsewhere. So if we pick a singularity, uh, sorry, singularity, a marked point on the surface, then at its neighborhood, um, the metric should look like a, um, like a cone, where the tip of the cone is precisely the marked point. And um, associated with this is this cone angle, which we will call alpha i for um, the piece, for the uh, marked uh, point i. 
And if you look at a point which is on the surface, which is not marked, then the neighborhood around this point should be isometric to the Euclidean plane. Okay. Um, when are, ah, before, before I go to the conformal equivalence, once we have a piecewise flat surface, so this triple S, V, and D, um, we get this additional structure on it, which is called the Delaunay decomposition. And I will sort of uh, assume that it's a triangulation because gener generically it is, but this whole theory can be generalized even in the cases where the Delaunay decomposition is not a triangulation. And um, important thing to note here is that the set of vertices for this Delaunay decomposition is precisely the set V of marked points. Okay. When are two piecewise linear metric discrete conformally equivalent? Well, first of all, they need to be defined on the same marked surface. And there is a more general version of this definition, but I will only talk about the situation where they, um, where the two piecewise linear metrics induce the same Delaunay triangulation. And in that case, the two PL metrics D and D tilde are discrete conformally equivalent when there exists a map from the set of marked points to R, which is called a discrete conformal factor. Such that if you take an edge of the triangulation, which is represented here and here, and you measure its two lengths with respect to these two metrics, they are um, related by a factor which is essentially defined by the mean value of this uh, factor u at the end vertices of this edge, which I will call the i and the j. Okay, what does this mean in practice? So let's say that we start with a uh, piecewise linear metric, um, which is this regular tetrahedron, and we wanna apply some kind of a conformal factor or conformal change to it. So what does this actually mean in practice? Um, so this, um, first of all, ah, before maybe before I uh, go into this, notice that if you label your marked points from one to n, um, you can write this conformal factor down just as sort of a vector in a vector space, which is finite dimensional because I forgot to mention that the set of marked points has to be finite. Um, and this means basically I mark my vertices one to four here on the left. And when you have a number associated to one vertex or to one marked point, it basically means that this, this number says how much you pull on this vertex. So in this first example, um, basically because you have zero, there is nothing happening on vertices two to four, and there is only something happening at vertex one. And because this number is positive, the edges that are adjacent to this vertex, they get stretched. Um, such as so, and so you obtain this kind of a longer, taller pyramid. And when the number is negative, such as in this second example, uh, the adjacent edges shrink. So here you can see, at least I hope you can tell from my pictures, um, that the edges one, two, two, four, and uh, two, three are shrinking. Discrete conformal equivalence can be extended to metrics with different Delaunay triangulations. And um, what I would like to point out is that in order to do this extension, have hyperbolic geometry pops up and actually it is somehow, it is a very natural, very canonical setting for this uh, defining discrete conformal equivalence, but I don't have time to talk about this um, right now, but I just would like to say that it's a beautiful like tool to use. So it's really, is worth reading. If you want to read about it, you can read one of those three papers. But anyway, at the end, what you obtain is that if you start with a surface SVD and you want to see or you want to parametrize the set of all conformally equivalent metrics to this surface, then you can parametrize the space as a finite dimensional vector space. And this is essential to the proof of the theorem. Okay. Now we have the new part. So um, before I define the discrete Gaussian curvature, let's recall what is the smooth Gaussian curvature. So we wanna define a, a Gaussian curvature of, of on a point P, at the point P of some 
smooth Riemannian surface. And for that, um, we pick a, an epsilon neighborhood of this point, where epsilon denotes the size of the neighborhood. And we look at its image under the Gauss map. And then the Gaussian curvature at the point P is the limit as the neighborhood shrinks of the signed area of the image of this neighborhood under the Gauss map divided by the area of the neighborhood itself. And it's a well-known fact that the Gaussian curvature is an intrinsic notion, so it's something that's only defined by the metric. And it has this um, characteristic that it scales by the factor one divided by R squared upon scaling the metric globally with a factor R. So we have, we kind of take this quotient as inspiration and we wanna preserve these two characteristics upon discretization. All right. And there we are. So let's have a look at the denominator first. Um, so we want to dis discretize signed area of an image of a Gauss map. And for that, recall that at a, um, at the neighborhood of my marked point I, the metric looks isometric, is isometric to a cone. And there is this cone angle popping up again. So if you sort of calculate the, um, the image of the, uh, of this neighborhood under Gauss map, what you get is 2 pi minus alpha i. And that's going to be our numerator. And this formula, as it is right now, is, is basically the definition of discrete Gaussian curvature. It's, it's, it's the formula that is used uh, by most of the people from this community, actually. And what's great about it is that it is an intrinsic notion because it's, it's defined solemnly by, by basically the only thing that we use to define the metric almost. But it's missing the scaling behavior. And that's somehow one could, but could think that's because there is some kind of a, you know, divisor of the area missing. So we wanna also uh, discretize this denominator here. And for that, we need some kind of a natural notion of a neighborhood. And what we pick is the Voronoi cell. which I will denote by VI. And then the formula reads, um, sorry for that, as follows. So it's the angle defect two pi minus alpha I divided by the area of the forums. Okay, now let's jump to the theorem. So the question is, having had this uh, formula of discrete Gaussian curvature, is every piecewise flat surface conformally equivalent to one with constant Gaussian curvature? And I will reformulate this theorem slightly. So we fix a piecewise flat surface. The question is, can we find a conformal factor in this conformal class um, such that the piecewise flat surface corresponding to this factor U has constant discrete Gaussian curvature? Okay, I'll quickly um, walk you through the proof. So the proof is quite technical, but there are two kind of um, really nice geometric ideas in it. And that's the ones that I would like to present to you. So the first thing you have to see is that we are, we are after this factor U, right? So the first thing we, um, we do is that we realize that we can find a functional such that this point U that we are searching for is a critical point of this functional. The second thing that we usually do is check if the formula is convex, uh, if the functional is convex. And unfortunately, it isn't. So <laughs> there, uh, we got actually a bit stuck. <laughs> and um, then we turned to this classical theorem that secures existence of critical points. And I didn't write the whole theorem down, but basically it reads roughly like this. So you start with like an unbounded sequence of these conformal factors and you search for a subsequence of this sequence with some properties. And then there is calculations, calculations and whatever. So what this leads to is that you look at these sequence of surfaces, which are given by some, by some sequence of, of conformal factors and you study its behavior or its development as n goes to infinity. 
Okay, this is less scary than it seems like because it's actually very geometric. And um, the cool thing is that because we have this possessive sub sub subsequence, this allows us to kind of assume a bunch of nice assumptions. So first of all, you can assume that um, all of your surfaces, the whole sequence of the surfaces has the same Delaunay triangulation. So the, the combinatorial structure is fixed. And the second thing that you can assume is that upon some global rescaling, the um, sequences at each of the vectors, um, at each of the vertices, either converge or diverge to infinity. And by that, I mean, they diverge kind of like in a monotonic fashion, they really, like <laughs> for any real number, you will, you will find some n such that all the others are higher. Okay. So the first lemma is, um, so now we have this triangulation and we know that um, the sequences at the vertices either diverge or converge. And the cool thing is that if you find one that diverges, um, you know that all the others around, so all the adjacent vertices converge. And the second lemma is, now we study this, this kind of a star, let's say, and this is how it looks like. So you, you start with some kind of, let's say, flattish star, and then n, as n goes to infinity, the um, edges that are adjacent to this red vertex, they, they, are, they are just large, they go, they go to infinity, their lengths go to infinity. So you end up with this kind of a prismatical shape. And the theorem says that, um, or the lemma says that the angle between these rays, so the, the infinitely large uh, long edges and these other edges is always pi half. And then the rest of the theorem is basically, or the rest of the proof is that you pump <laughs> this uh, observation into the functional and you do some technical calculations and um, then, then you've proven the theorem. But what I would like to point out is that this fact, this, this, this behavior, this, this has nothing to do with the functional, it's just how the sequence of surfaces behaves if you assume Delaunay triangulation. So, if you can use it in your research somehow, I would be very happy to, to you know, hear, I would be very happy if this would be used because I think this, yeah, is a, maybe some valuable information for the community. Okay, in my last um, <laughs> one minute, uh, how about uniqueness? Uh, so that's something that cannot be swept under the rack. In the smooth case, of course, there is uniqueness or at least uniqueness up to some classified um, yeah, uh, maps, and here the uniqueness just doesn't hold, which is a bit um, disappointing. And it's not only that we would find like some counter examples, we found like whole families of counter examples. So I don't think that even if one would sort of want to say it doesn't, it is unique up to this and that, that you can find a reasonable this and that so that you can claim that it is um, unique up to this and that. But nevertheless, uh, the existence hold, and that's all I have for you today in the 15 minutes. Um, maybe before we go for questions, a special thanks to the organizers for putting this workshop together. And also a uh, big thanks to the discrete differential geometry group in Berlin, and in particular, uh, Boris Springborn for you know, supporting this, uh, this project. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anna, I think for short and fortunately because we would have probably like to hear more about the proof in the background are there any questions I mean, we don't have a lot of time for questions yeah, i i have a simple question uh, but thanks hannah for the really nice talk uh, do you think your theorem will also be true for a prescribing curvature case uh yeah um as in I, I did think about it and I think it's not, I think it's not possible. Um, yeah, as in, yeah. I think it definitely doesn't generalize kind of trivially because I remember I, I tried, you know, doing it for like two afternoons and it didn't work out.
I see, but you don't have a count example yet. Ah, no, 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 as in, no. <laughs> uh, I mean, I don't, yeah. I mean, I, I'm, maybe it is possible. I don't know if sort of you can prove it using this um, um, ar artillery, <laughs> let's say. But I don't have even like an intuition whether, like I can't say yes, it definitely holds or no, it definitely doesn't. Thanks. So we have a question from David. At least I saw him, you raising your hand. <laughs> yeah, no, I have a question. Um, a really interesting talk and I'm, I'm excited to learn more. Um, I was just wondering if your, uh, if your method works for other choices of uh, um, areas. So, so you choose the, the Voronoi cell, but there's some other, that, other sort of natural choices of area that come up in other contexts. So I was yeah. I where that comes in. Yeah. Um, yeah. We, we just. <laughs> this was one of the questions for my uh, for my defense actually. <laughs> um, so, but I had more than a year to talk to think about it right now. Um, so, in, if you change the um, the notion of area, you need to change the functional. So, um, the functional is chosen such that basically, if you like differentiate it. Right, because the, the, the critical points of it are the exactly those that do the trick. So the function kind of consists of two parts. One of them um, gives the angle defect and the other one gives the um, gives the area. So if you change the area, would need to change the other part. So if you if you come up with a good function whose derivative gets you the the area that you that you desire, then then it might work, yeah. Right. There's there's sort of a natural one that's the derivative of the area with respect to the conformal factor, and that's slightly different than the the um, the Voronoi cell. So that that would be an interesting one to check. And I would imagine that because it's the derivative of the area with respect to the conformal factor, maybe it's possible to put that together with what you have. So that'd be interesting. But if you hmm. that one is the Voronoi area. Yeah, it is twice the Voronoi area. That's exactly what we're using. It's, oh, it's twice. You're right in that setting. So yeah, but that's that's exactly what we're using. <laughs> that's right. Oh, yeah. so that's what you're using. So if you move it yeah. from okay, sorry, I was thinking about the weighted case. In the weighted case, it looks different than the the weighted Voronoi cell. Um, but you're right. It's twice the. It's because it's, that's because they the Voronoi cells intersect at the uh, at the midpoints. But anyway. To change this to a weighted is exactly that. Okay, interesting. All right, I don't want to take up the time, but thank you. Good we'll talk later. No we, we, we have time for one short question. I see Aras, you raise your hand. Yeah, definitely very short question. Uh, probably basic one too. Uh, uh, do you define alpha as the uh, the core and angle, right? Can you explain yeah. a bit how you define that for the discrete case? Uh, what, what do you mean? Uh, what, what does so? Uh, I'm not sure if coin angle means the angle like in between the sides. Ah, or is it I, can, angle around I, can, it? I can just probably show you. So, so if you have the cone, if you have the cone, mm -hmm. um, you can kind of just slice it apart and then you lay it flat, and the cone angle is precise to this. And if you look at some kind of a vertex in a triangulation, mm -hmm. then you just sum the angles. You know, around that around that vertex, and that's that's the same thing. It's basically, I mean, it's exactly what Keenan was talking about in his talk: is that you can kind of ignore the edges. Uh -huh. uh, got it, got it. So it's like angle around, not in between, right? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I okay. didn't, I didn't. Sorry, I didn't specify that. But it's it's exactly like if you just cut it open. It's, mm -hmm. Got it. Thank it's you. It's this wedge. Yeah, yeah. That that answers my question. Thanks. Okay. So thank you. Before thanking you, Hannah, I just want to mention a, a small uh, note that was put on the chat, and I completely agree with that. Jack Snaring really congratulate you for the quality of the communication tools oh. that you've been using, as well thank as for you. using this uh, very smooth colored background that really oh, helps in uh, <laughs> conveying the information. So thank it's you. Actually the first time I used it, I was a bit nervous. You know? <laughs> so thank you, Anna. And uh, now we're going.